Welcome back to another uh, session on the engineering project. In the last one, I opened up a discussion about the relationship between other intelligent devices connected into your controller or processor through I.O. configuration. And I decided I wasn't finished pontificating, elaborating on that subject. So we're going to do some of that today. And time permitting, we'll get back to the programming. In the last session, I said the next session would include sequencing, how I do sequencing. First, I'm going to throw a little light on the subject, so I turned on an overhead light so you could see the hardware better. I'm going to start with this Micrologix 1100. When you think of a PLC, you should think of a processor with memory and with I.O., an I.O. interface an electrical interface to integrate input devices and output devices into the unit through the processor to the memory. And then you can access the state of that I.O. which is represented by snapshots saved in the memory. Okay, so this controller, it's a controller because it has a processor and it has embedded I.O. It also has an I.O. port. So this little connector right here allows you to connect additional, I believe it's 1762 I.O. modules. It's a ribbon cable that plugs into here and the modules can sit uh, flush with each other. So if you want to get more information into the memory to use in your program, you can add more I.O. modules over here. But those I.O. modules are fairly limited. There's discrete, analog, but it's fairly limited. Another way to get more information into the memory of this controller is through the communication ports. And this unit has two communication ports. It has Ethernet and it has, um, we'll call it an RS-232 or DH-485. You can configure it for two different protocols. But let's just say it's a serial port. This is a serial port, Ethernet, and this could be 232 or DH485, which is a, a addressable network of up to 32 nodes, whereas R32 is not a network, it's just here to there, this to that, uh, one end to the other end of the cable. You can also change some of the information and memory through this little LCD screen and these push buttons. Now, I'm starting with this because this is the probably the simplest example of ways to get information into memory for you to use in your program. So anything you plug into here, into this I.O. port or this I.O. connector expansion port, it is automatically set up to update for the processor to update the memory locations that are represented by these additional modules over here. You don't have to do any programming. You only have to configure it with those additional I.O. modules. Anything you do through these two ports, you're going to have to use message instructions or you're going to have to use a piece of hardware like a panel view that is designed to plug directly in here and you configure it and the uh, panel view is going to read and write to memory locations actually through either one of these ports. So you can change the memory location values in this processor's memory by changing the state of I.O., including the embedded I.O. that's in this processor, this controller, or through either one of these two ports, okay? Now that's the Micrologix. I don't have a Slick 500 to show you, but a Slick 500 is not much different than that Micrologix 1100, except that the Slick 500 has two ports on it, and it can be combinations of DH45, RS-232, Ethernet, Data Highway Plus. You know, it's, it's got two ports on the front of it right on the front of the processor. The connector on the back of the processor is not 
a communications port. It is a connection to the back plane or the I.O. bus that connects to the modules. So that would be the same as that connector on the Microlytics 1100, except that this, this does not plug into, I covered it back up, I put the cover on. This does not snap into a chassis. Instead, you extend the bus or the back plane by a ribbon cable to the next module and then there's another ribbon cable to the next and the next and the next and so forth. Select 500 is not much different other than it has a hardware back plane, a chassis, that you slide modules into and that connects it into that equivalent connector that's on the back of the Select 500 processor. Now moving ahead to really what we're after is the more modern controllers like this Control Logix. This Control Logix has two ports on it. Okay, in the past all um, processors for the most part had two ports. Okay, um, this also has two ports but you only see one on the front. Okay, that's RS-232 DF1. But there's another port on the back this connector right here is not an I.O. connector. It does not plug into a, an I.O. backplane. It plugs into a 32-bit network. It's a parallel cable, 32-bit parallel cable. It's a control bus. And this processor communicates through this connector across a backplane not to be confused with the type of back plane that's in a Slick 500, but a this is a passive back plane in the sense that the chassis, and we'll call it just the 32 conductors that represent the um, network connection, it's passive. It's, there's no electronics really involved. Now, somebody might want to, you know, argue that point. Uh, don't waste your time, okay? This is a 32-bit parallel network that this plugs into and it communicates with other devices on that same network. For that reason, this processor can plug into any slot of a 1756 chassis. It doesn't matter what slot. Now, once you write your program and you say it's in slot 2, it better be in slot 2. But the point is that that 1756 chassis from a logical standpoint, from a conceptual standpoint, is just a parallel cable that connects this connector, this network connector, to other connectors, daisy chain, in 7, 10, 13, 17 slot chassis. So this processor has a port on the front and a port on the back, which means that you can come in through this RS-232 connector with all manner of devices and you can change the state of memory locations. You can change the values, the bits, everything. You can also do the same thing through this port. But in order to use this port, you have to have another module that can also plug into that same backplane. So let's take, um, well here's a control net card, okay? And you see it has the same connector on the back of it these two devices can plug into any two slots in that chassis because that chassis is just a network connector just like an ethernet cable for serial that chassis is a parallel cable for control bus okay now this happens to be a control net module and it has a port on the back just like this processor and it has a port on the bottom that coax connector is the connector to control net. This module is called a bridge module because it bridges from this connector, that coax connector, control net, to the control bus that's the back plane that these plug into. That's one way to get information into the memory of this processor. Another, and the more popular, and typically the one that I always use, is Ethernet. So you notice the same connector on both of these. Identical connectors. 
So when you plug these into any combination of slots, they it's just it's just the same as daisy chaining Ethernet cables through a switch, a hub. It's effectively the same thing, but this is 32-bit parallel, okay? So it takes special electronics in all of these different devices in order to transmit the information. Now, the back connector, that's control bus. This is Ethernet, the connector on the bottom of this. Okay, so there's two ports on this Ethernet module. An Ethernet port and a control bus port. This module bridges the gap, so it takes the Ethernet packets, strips them down, pulls out the actual information of interest, repacks it into the protocol for the control bus that's on the back plane, and that's how Ethernet stuff gets into the memory of this processor. Another version would be this Compact Logix. Now this Compact Logix has one port on the front, okay? And that is RS-232 basically. And on the back it has two ports. On this side it has an I.O. port or an I.O. connector and on this side it has a passive back plane. So this is the same type of connection that this control logics processor has on the back is for a control bus. Now it's not identical, but it saves the same function. So with this processor, you can come in through the front with um, communications. You're gonna have to use message instructions to do it. And you can read from the memory in the controller, the processor's memory, and you can write to the memory in the processor. From this side, this has I.O. that connects, and you would take, uh, here's a 1769 input card. You just take a slide that in, and then you have a little uh, lever that allows you to press the connector. I'll take this back off so you can see it. This has a connector that slides in and out. A little cumbersome with the camera here. Trying to keep it in view, but it has a little connector that slides in and out. So, on the back of the Compact Logics, this one, which is the the L40 series, this is a 45. There's also a 43. is It was a unique product because it had the passive or the active back plane, the I/O back plane on one side, and had the passive on the other. And into this passive connector, you can connect an Ethernet module. Now this Ethernet module, bridge card, if you want to call it that, has the same connector on both sides. On that side and on that side. One's a male and one's a female. So I can connect, take this Ethernet card and plug it right into that processor. Okay. Then I can take, this is a Circos card for uh, motion control and I can snap that right in. So now I have two modules connected to the passive back plane and if I wanted to I could take and it's easier if these are laying down flat so I'm not going to push it in. But I can connect I.O. modules then on the other side. So this is an active back plane and this is a passive back plane. You see there are a number of ways that you can get information into the processor's memory. With I.O. configuration, with compact logics and with control logics, instead of using message instructions to communicate between one smart device and another, if you integrate it through the I.O. configuration, all that's taken care of for you. There's a chipset in the processor that operates with the back plane as far as uh, I.O. goes. Now, this guy right here, the L45, it's got an Ethernet module, and that Ethernet module converts Ethernet to the 
uh, bus protocol that goes into the processor. On this side though, it's just straight up, it goes out and it collects inputs at the, before the scan and it sends out outputs after the scan. So it, this side right here behaves like a regular PLC, this behaves like a PAC. When we were talking about the FANUC robots, if you have an EDS file and your controller supports adding smart intelligent devices out there as I.O., all that communication is taken care of for you. If you're using something else, you're going to have to use message instructions to get information in and out of that processor's memory. Well, that was rough. Uh, that was totally unscripted. I just went and grabbed some hardware and uh, started rattling on. So uh, I ran out of time trying to keep these things under 20 minutes. So I'll just start another one and talk about the programming. My apologies for not getting the programming. And I wanted to make sure you understood the relationship between getting information in and out of your processor's memory through the I.O. configuration as opposed to the communication ports using message instructions. Because with the I.O. configuration, that now includes Ethernet. So you can include kind of the Ethernet bridge card as part of your I.O. just like you would the control net or the device net. I would like to say that with device net, uh, it's Achilles heel was that the DeviceNet scanner module was a node on the DeviceNet network. And anything that took place on the DeviceNet network took place between the scanner module and other devices on the DeviceNet network. Not between the processor and devices on the network. So the scanner module had to collect up information off DeviceNet, store it, and then it took information out of another chunk of memory and sent it out to the devices for outputs. Separately, over the back plane between the scanner module and the processor, another transaction of data took place. So one could not see the other. That's why if you lost the scan list for your device net network, you might as well pack your bags and leave the state because you're dead meat. Anyway, uh, thank you for your um, patience with this.